benefit out of what's in a passage and bring it into our lives. Remember, there's not one right way to study the Bible. There are many ways to study the Bible. But often, we don't get a lot out of our Bible study because all we do is read. We come, we read the passage, we close our Bible, and we go away. And we don't get the benefit. We want to talk about how do we actually get more out of the Bible passage and how do we actually do that. So today, we want to look at four keys to help unlock the meaning of any passage of Scripture. Number one is going to be observation. What does the text say? What's the Bible passage going to say? Number two, after we see what it says, then we ask the question of interpretation. Okay, that's what it says, but what does that mean? We'll say, the Bible always says what it means, right? Now, the Bible means what it means. And sometimes we look at face value, but we have to say, what does it really mean when it says this? We'll talk about that in a minute. Third step is comparison. What, do, what other passages relate to this passage? And how do we compare Scripture with Scripture to come up with a true understanding of what the Bible says? The fourth step is application. Okay, so now that I know what it means, now I see other passages, how do I apply this to my life? So those are the four keys that we use in Bible study. We want to consider each one today. When we come to a passage, we simply observe what it says. We write down what we see in a Bible passage. Why write things down? Number one, because our memory is so short. Because we can read something, and then a minute later we say, now, what did I just read? And we forget so quickly. Uh, writing it down is also a form of multiple reinforcement. By writing things down, it causes us to think more slowly, to think about what we're actually seeing, and it's, it's just another way to get it into our mind. So, to be able to organize, to synthesize what we see, we write down what we see. Secondly, we come to interpretation. We look at what the text actually means. And uh, we talked a couple weeks ago about the idea that the Bible is not written as a, a technical manual, that there are figures of speech used in Scripture. And uh, sometimes it is very conversational in the wording, sometimes it uses euphemisms. Uh, we talk about the sun comes up at 6 a.m. in the morning. It's not a scientific fact about the sun revolving around the earth or the earth revolving about around the sun. It's simply just a general statement that talks about sunrise. And we understand that uh, there are figures of speech in Scripture. One of my favorite passages is in uh, Judges 3, where Ehud, the valiant warrior, say, I don't know Ehud's story. It's a neat story. That, I mean, that's a man story. That's an exciting story about conquest and victory. Uh, Judges chapter 3. Ehud goes in and he kills Eglon, the king of the Moabites. And he locks the door of the king's bedroom. And the servants are outside, not knowing what's going on with the king. And they say, surely he covereth his feet in the supper chamber. He's covering his feet. Well, what in the world does that mean? The reality is that's a, a, a very nice way of saying he's relieving himself. He's having a bowel movement. You say, oh, that's disgusting. Well, it's, that's why it's called a euphemism. It's a very nice way of dealing with something that we don't like to talk about a whole lot. But it's not the idea that it's anything having to do with his feet. So when we come to Scripture, we say, well, you know, we read the Word, but we have to also look to say, what, does the, what do the words mean? How do we come up with the meaning? We look in context. We look at the words around it, and we come up with the meaning of the passage. Thirdly, then we ask, well, are there other passages that have similar themes, uh, similar th stories that they're uh, similar ideas, and we compare Scripture with Scripture? What we so often do is when we come to Scripture, we say, okay, let me open up a, a, a commentary or my daily bread, or let me see what somebody else has to say about the Bible. And I'll ask somebody else what it means. Instead, we should say, okay, what does the Bible mean? Let me see if the Bible has anything else to say about the same idea I'm reading here today. We'll talk about that today. How do we actually find what else the Bible has to say? What tools do we use? And then we go on to the fourth step to say, okay, now I, I see what it says, I see what it means, I see other passages, how do I apply it? What am I going to do about it? Now that I know what the Bible tells me to do, 
what am I going to do about it? So hopefully by now you've found Philippians 2. We want to look at the passage as we talked last week when we look for the illumination, we want the light to go on. We always start by asking God to turn the light on for us. Uh, we read a, a verse from Psalms. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in thy law. So let's do that. Let's pray together and ask God to open our eyes. Father, this morning as we come to your word, we know it's easy for us to read the words. We learn to read and write. But we need your Holy Spirit to turn the light on for us so that we can go beyond just the words on the page and see the meaning and the interpretation and the application for our lives. Help us, Lord, each to come away with a greater understanding of how to study your word and a greater love for your word because of what we see today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Whenever we take the time to study a passage, we always want to start with the context of the context. We want to talk about the setting. Uh, I love to talk about timelines. I say whenever we come to a book of the Bible, we want to say, okay, on a timeline, where does this fit in? Because Genesis and Daniel and Matthew and Revelation were all written at very different times, in very different settings. And so we always want to start with the context. Here in Philippians 2, knowing this is a passage in the New Testament, that tells us this happened about 2,000 years ago, about AD 61. How do we know that? We can go through a process of comparing historical dates. But on most of your Bibles, most of you have some form of a study Bible that probably at the beginning of any book, either up at the top, we'll say a date when it was written, date AD 61, or have a little paragraph or two of introduction telling you who wrote the book and when it was written. So the book of Philippians is a book that is written about 30 years after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. It is written to a church at Philippi. That's why it's called Philippians. Philippi. It's written to the Christians at Philippi. Uh, we see that in verse 1 of Philippians. We know from Acts 16, by comparing Scripture with Scripture, that Philippi is a Roman colony in Macedonia, what today we call Greece. So Paul is in Rome. He's in prison writing to Christians in Greece in a city called Philippi. If you want to learn more about Philippi, you can go to any Bible encyclopedia and you can read a lot about the city, see pictures of the ruins of the city, and learn a lot more about the city, which helps you to appreciate the setting that the passage is written in. Paul is writing from Rome. He's been in prison for preaching about the crucified Christ, and he has appealed to Caesar. People, the Jews have tried to kill him, and his life is spared. He appeals to Caesar so that uh, he is, has a chance to make a, a profession to Caesar. And he ends up in church history, tells us, being released and set go, set free. And so the church at Philippi, as we'll see in a little bit, had actually sent an offering to Paul to help him with expenses. Uh, we read that in chapter 4. So the book of Philippians is really a long thank you note. Paul is in Roman prison sending a thank you note to this church over in Greece who sent an offering to help him out with his expenses. So now we come to the passage. Philippians 2, starting in verse 19. Paul writes and says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I have received news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself. Because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things will go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you in his distress because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. 
welcome him in the Lord with great joy. And honor men like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give him. At first, this passage doesn't seem real deep. It's one that we would try to read very quickly, and we'd say, oh, that's nice, and pass right on, and not give it a second thought. Uh, so many times, we want to get on to the good stuff. We want to get into some deep doctrinal truth about salvation, and we want to go on to Bible prophecy and talk about end times and signs and colors of horses. And so many times we come to a passage like this, and we read right over it and say, oh, that's nice, and go on. But we miss a lot of good truth when we do that. Remember, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture, in my inspiration God, is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. We talk about the idea of a path. Uh, it, it, when we, it shows us when we're off the path, it helps us get on the path, it helps us stay on the path. All Scripture is beneficial. And so many times we say, well, you know, I like certain books. I like Psalms. That's nice. And I like Romans. And, oh, I like, the book. I like the Gospels. But all of Scripture is beneficial for us. Romans 15, 4 says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Paul says to the Romans, you know, All the Old Testament Scriptures are all written to encourage us so that we will have hope. We come to a passage like this and say, Well, that really didn't give me a lot of hope. That's just because we read the scripture. We haven't taken the time to study it, to think about it, to go deeper in scripture. We haven't chewed the cut. So we want to take some time to go beyond just reading and to reflect a little bit deeper. As we look at this passage, we see it talks about two men. So our focus in this is primary, primarily going to be about men, but we're going to be able to apply the principles to women as well. And so we want to go through four steps that we have talked about already. First step, observation. What do I see? When we look at this passage, what do we observe? Well, number one, we see Paul intends to send two men to Philippi. We see he's planning on sending Timothy, he's planning on sending Epaphroditus. Uh, 19, he hopes to send Timothy soon. 25, He's planning to send him back a paradise. It's not something that gets us real excited and gives us a lot of hope, but it's something we see in the passage, so we can write that down. <clears throat> Number two, next thing we observe, we see what well, Epaphroditus had been in Philippi. Paul says he's sending him back, which means he was there before. Uh, as you go on to study, we see that he actually was their messenger. So the church at Philippi had sent Epaphroditus to Paul. And now he's planning on sending him back. Next thing we see is Paul is endorsing these men as role models. We see Paul saying in verse 20 about Timothy. He says, I have no one else like him. He's one of a kind. Verse 29, he says about Epaphroditus, honor men like him. So this is a really high honor to have the Apostle Paul. Many times we put the Apostle Paul right below Jesus, somewhere up around Moses and Abraham. And the Apostle Paul says, you honor men like Epaphroditus. That is a, a great testimony to Epaphroditus' life. But we say, okay, Timothy and Epaphroditus are role models. We need to follow them. We need to honor them. We have to ask the question then. So what are these men like? We're supposed to honor men like them, so what are they like? And that causes us to look a little bit further in the passage. As we seek to answer that question, it helps us to come up with some great truth that we can apply to our lives. So as we practice observation, we write down what we observe Paul saying in the passage, what he says about Timothy, what he says about Epaphroditus. So what does he say in verse 20 and 21? Paul says about Timothy, he takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Verse 22, he says, Timothy has proved himself. Verse 25, he says, Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier. Verse 26, he says, he longs for all of you and is distressed. Verse 30, he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life. So those are some things we observe. Those are some things we write down. And we come up then to the second step of the process, which is interpretation. 
Say, okay, I've seen some things. Now the question is, what does it mean? And so from fleshing out our observations, we come away with five marks of what it means to be a man or woman of God. Five qualities that God desires in our lives. Five qualities that are worthy of honor in our life. First, first observation was that Paul didn't have anyone else like Timothy. So why? What made Timothy so special? Why was it that Timothy was different than everybody else? Verse 20 says, he takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Comparing Timothy, who's interested, in verse 21, he says, everyone else looks out for his own interests. So what was the quality of Timothy? that made him stand out, why there was no one else like him, it was that he had a genuine interest in others, while everyone else was concerned with themselves. So how do we get more meaning out of the phrase? One very good way is using different translations of the Bible. Reality is that many of us have more than one Bible in our home. Uh, some of us will have several Bibles, and there are different translations of the Bible. Uh, King James Version is one, New International Version, New American Standard Version. There are many different translations that we can use. In most English translations, there are 8,000 different English words that are used. If you actually look at the Hebrew and Greek that the Bible was originally written in, there are over 11,000 Hebrew and Greek words. So we are using less English words to convey a meaning expressed by these more specific Hebrew and Greek words. So sometimes it's very helpful to use different translations to get a better understanding of the meaning. A good idea of this is in the English language, in, the, in, in your Bible, you'll see the word love. And most of you have probably heard this before. Uh, a good story is the story of Peter, where, where Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I know. You know I love you. Where Jesus is saying, Peter, do you have that deep down godly love for me? Peter says, Lord, you're my friend. But by using the same word love, we don't get that deeper meaning. In Greek, there's actually four different words. One is uh, eros, which is the erotic sexual love. One is storge, uh, an emotional love. One is phileo, the, the kinship, brotherly kindness love. And one is agape, the godly, deep committed love, unconditional love. But in English, we use the same word, love. So to help us get a, a fuller understanding of the meaning, it's often very helpful to use different translations. Uh, I know some of you, I know Jason and some others, that we have uh, Bibles that are actually parallel Bibles, that on, you open up the Bible, and on those two pages, you might have four different translations all together. So you can read over one column, read a verse, and you read over the next column, and see it expressed in a different translation. Let me mention that there are two different types of Bibles. There are translations and there are paraphrases. Let me quickly mention the difference. Translation is where scholars come together and say, they look at the Hebrew, they look at the Greek that the Bible was originally written, written, written in and say, okay, what do these words mean? And they translate the words into English. A paraphrase is where somebody comes and they look at the words and say, okay, how can I put this into different words? And they don't necessarily have a, a strict need, need to be, be conformed to the exact translation of the words. They're trying to communicate the passion and feeling of the text. Both are very beneficial. Both are helpful. But when we try to come up with doctrinal truth, we want to make sure we're coming with a translation. What does the Bible actually say? But to get more of the emotion, more of the feeling, more of the passion, the paraphrases will often help us reflect more of the emotion. Uh, some very good paraphrases. Uh, some of you are familiar for years now with one called the Living Bible. Uh, another modern paraphrase is called the Message, where it takes the scripture and, and just puts it in different words that helps us understand it. But by coming to translations and paraphrases, we can often get deeper meaning out of the scripture. So, for example, in verse 20, the New Living Translation puts it this way. It says, I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. The New American Standard says, For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genu genuinely be concerned for your welfare. 
So this amplifies the idea of interest. It's not just Timothy's curious, he's not just interested. He has a, a care, he has a concern for the people. So what do we come away with? Godly men are caring. Timothy is compassionate, he's concerned with others, he's unselfish. He's not just focused upon himself, but he really cares about other people. Our culture tells us, you know, everything should be about me. You know, have it your way. You deserve a break today. You know, everything's about me. But godly men are not focused on themselves. They care about others. A godly man puts others first. If we look up at verse 4 of the same passage, in Philippians 2, 4, Paul states, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. If we want to follow God and we want to do what God wants, we need to be concerned not just with ourselves, we need to be concerned with others. And so here is another passage in the Bible that compares that same idea. Timothy cares not just about himself, but about others. In verse 4, we say we should all be caring about others. It's that idea that we'll, that we'll talk a little bit more about of this uh, comparing Bible passage with Bible passage. Here in the same chapter, in a different setting, we see the same idea expressed that we need to be caring about others. So godly men are caring. And we break that down. Second thing we observed, why we take note of them, says in verse 2, Timothy has proved himself. The word proof here means tested, verified, checked out, reliable. Timothy has shown himself to be reliable and faithful. So here's the second quality that we would then mark down for ourselves. Godly men are consistent. They keep their word. If they say they're going to do something, they follow through and do it. They are consistent in their values. They don't say one thing to your face and then go out and live a totally different way. They're not hypocrites. <laughs> Comparing scripture with scripture, one of the first passages that jumps to my mind, he said, well, how passages jump to your mind? By reading the Bible, by being familiar with other passages. But one of the first passages that jumps to my mind is Galatians 2. Paul says that uh, when he met Peter, he had to confront him because Peter was wishy-washy. Paul writes and says, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. So Peter was wishy-washy. He was, he was with one group, the Gentiles, but then when all the Jews came, then he got up and left them and went over with all the Jews. And Paul says, no, Peter, that's wrong. You're, you're doing the wrong thing. And he confronted him because godly men need to be consistent. Godly men are caring. Godly men are consistent. Third thing we see, godly men are cooperative. When we looked up in verse 25, we see about Epaphroditus. It says, my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier. So here are three metaphors about Epaphroditus, but they all have something similar. Paul says he's my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier. Because the Christian life is like a family. It's like a fellowship. It's like a fight. As a family, we're all related. Mark 3.35, Jesus says, For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. 1 Peter 4.17, For it is time judgment to begin with the family of God. So we're all related in the church. We are all family, brothers and sisters in Christ. We get to choose our friends, but our family is chosen for us. Anyone who is a Christian is my brother or my sister. Christian life is like a fellowship. 1 John 1, 3. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. So we work together and we serve together. We are teammates. We're all on the same team. The Christian life is a fight. We have the same enemy, Satan. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. So many times, and I've mentioned this before, we look at other churches as the competition, as the enemy. Well, they get, have more people than we do, and we want to get more people than they do. No. Our enemy is sin. Our enemy is sin in the world and all the temptations out there. We are teammates with the other churches in town, with other brothers and sisters in Christ. So, 
What do these three things have in common? God has called us into relationships. The tendency of man is isolation. Women are pack animals. You go out to a restaurant and with a big group, and one woman says, I'm going to the bathroom. Seven to ten other ladies get up, and they all parade off together. But men are lone rangers. We are withdrawn and quiet. We don't share very deeply. We men get excited, yeah, have a sports game, they'll shout and cheer. But they don't talk deeply about themselves and what's going on in their hearts. And, you know, wife comes and says, Honey, what are you thinking right now? Nothing. Uh, which is true. Uh, men often don't get real deep. But godly men break the pattern. By our sin nature, we tend to be isolated. But scripturally, in our new nation, we know that God has called us into relationships. Ecclesiastes 4.9, two are better than one, because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him. Godly men know that they need to be in relationship. So godly men are caring, they're consistent, they're cooperative. Fourth thing that we observe, verse 26, he longs for all of you and is distressed. These are some strong emotional words. What's going on here? The Paphroditus had traveled a long way from Philippi in Greece all the way over to Rome in Italy. And he's bringing a gift to Paul from the church at Philippi. And along the way, he couldn't just hop on a plane and be there in a couple hours. He's traveling by foot possibly on a, on a boat, but that boat wouldn't have been a big cruise ship. It would have been a much smaller boat. You're maybe traveling by a donkey. Possibly a horse, probably not, but possibly. But either way, it was a long, arduous journey. And along the way, Aphrodite just got sick. And he kept on going. Got so sick, he almost died. When the church at Philippi heard about it, they were worried for his health. And word had come back to Epaphroditus that the church was worried about him. And then he got distressed because they were worried about him. And he was so concerned about them. Because his brothers and sisters were distressed. He's worried about the fact that they're worried about him. And we see from that, godly men are compassionate. Godly men not only have logical responses. If, if, you, want, if you want an answer, come to a man. If you want compassion and feeling come to a woman. Oh, somebody comes and says, have a problem? A woman will say, oh, that's so, that's so sad. I'm going to give you a hug. A man says, let me give you the answer. <laughs> men are often logical. They, they want to just give answers, but godly men go beyond just the logic. And they express emotion. They express emotion by reaching out to others and uh, giving compassion with the issues they're dealing with. Where else do we see that idea in Scripture? That's the third step. We'll comment again on that in a few minutes. Comparison, letting the Bible comment on itself. Romans 12, 15, though, shows us that this is a quality that we are to have. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. So if we are going to follow God, we want to be involved in the emotions of others as well. 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. And treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. It's a sad commentary that many times we treat total strangers better than we treat those who we treat. But godly men are compassionate. They care. They have emotion toward others. And they care about what others are going through. Fifth observation, verse 30, it said he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life. Godly men are courageous. Notice it's not a self-centered courage. He's not risking so he gets a big financial gain. He's not in it for himself. This says in verse 30, he's risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. He's placing his life on the line for the work of the Lord. If I said, you know, Bernie Spinner was down in Florida, and she really had, had a number of bad, uh, bad luck things happen to her, 
and she needs uh, she needs some encouragement. She needs a gift. We're going to take an offering, but there's be somebody who'd be willing to fly down and take the offering down to Bernice. I'm sure somebody said, "Yeah, I'll do it. I've got two days free. I'll fly down there and fly back." But it'd be a very different story if I said. Would you walk down the farm and take this gift to Bernice and then walk all the way back? And each one of us would be saying, well, I get shots for you. I think we're going to do it. To think about traveling hundreds and hundreds of miles, placing your life, your time, your age, your comfort on the line. We don't like to step out of our comfort zones. But godly men are willing to risk to step out of their comfort zones for the sake of God, for the sake of ministry, to take personal sacrifice to minister to others. So we, we've gone through here, we've seen observation, we looked at what we saw, then we went through the second step of interpretation. We have gone beyond the thinking, what does this mean? Now we look at the third step, comparison. We've already mentioned this a couple times. The Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. When we read a passage, we see what other passages talk about the same idea. And before we open up a commentary, says, let me see what John MacArthur has to say or David Jeremiah has to say. We want to turn to the Bible and say, what does God have to say? What else does the Bible say about this idea? And sometimes the Holy Spirit can just bring to mind passages we've read before. But he only does that if we've read it. So, don't just say, well, God will just miraculously reveal to me a Bible verse and just pop out Job 15. No. God's going to reveal to our memory things we've read already, which is another reason why we read the Bible. But, another way of finding things are great tools that are actually in our Bibles that we can use. One tool is called a concordance. And uh, there are uh, big books that you can get. Uh, the most popular one, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. And they are lists of words. And you open, open it up like a dictionary, turn to any word. So if there's one word you want to see, compassion. You don't you go to like a dictionary and look for the word compassion. And then you'd see every Bible verse that has that word compassion in it. And they have different concordances for different translations. Because the word compassion might be translated differently than the New International Version. So we'll actually give you a list of every time that that word is used. Uh, in most study Bibles, in the back you have a short concordance. It's not a full listing of every verse, of every time the word is used, but many times in the back there will be a concordance of key times that a certain word is used. So if you are studying about something like compassion, you can go to a concordance and look for other places in Scripture where it talks about compassion. Another tool that most Bibles have is called cross-references. Uh, often it's in the center column of your Bible, sometimes it's at the bottom of the page, sometimes it's out on the, on the outer margins. But you can read a Bible verse and you'll see like a little, a little italic A or B there by a verse or by a word. And you can go out to the margin and you see it'll say A, uh, C John 15 says. And then you turn over there and you see another verse that has that same idea. So the reality is many of us have these tools in our Bible that we've never even used them. We never even knew what they were there for. Just do what there's a lot of little print on the sides. That's to help us compare scripture with scripture. So that when we're looking at a passage, we can compare other Bible passages that have similar ideas. But the most important part of the Bible study is always the fourth part, application. It does us no good just to read a passage and then close the Bible and go away and do nothing about it. James 1.22, we've used this Bible verse before. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. We need to do something with what we see. In our studies on Sunday nights, we've been talking about how we can learn to mask the meaning of the passage and follow through with putting it into practice in our lives. Uh, last week we talked about this space pets idea. But when we come to the text, we want to say, okay, now I see what it means. What do I do with it? How do I apply it to my life? How will it change the way I live? So as we think about this idea here uh, of, of coming to the passage, we say, what am I going to do about it? How can I follow through? First of all, we see 
See, Paul says we are to honor men and women like this. Okay, so as we identify the, the qualities, we did that by studying a little bit deeper in interpretation. Okay, honor people who are caring, who are consistent, who are cooperative, who are compassionate, who are courageous. Then we want to figure out, okay, now that I have identified those qualities, how do I honor people like that? So think, do you know anybody who's like that? Do you know anybody who's caring? Do you know anybody who has consistent testimony? Do you know anybody who is compassionate? Do you know anybody who's just a great team player, very cooperative? Do you know anybody who's courageous, who would, who would be bold in following God? Well then, ask yourself, how could I honor them? Pray about it. Say, God, how could I honor them? If, if, I, if I think of Jerry Simmons, Say, Jerry is one of those men. How can I honor Jerry? <coughs> the Holy Spirit will bring to your mind ideas. But, for example, if you know somebody like that, maybe you can write them a card this week. Just send the card. You can even send it anonymously. If you didn't say, oh, I couldn't do that. Send it anonymously. Just say, uh, I just wanted to write and thank you for the example you set by your life. When I think about your example, I think about this. And tell the qualities you've seen in their life. Thank you so much for setting the example. Feel free to sign your name and send it to them. I'll tell you what, that would mean a world to the person who received that card. Chances are they probably haven't received a card like that in months or even years. So, one way we honor them would be maybe writing the card, uh, sending a thank you note. Know, like, call them up on the phone. And just say, this one didn't tell you I appreciate you. You've set a great example for me. Uh, talk to them in person. So, one idea is actually doing something to show honor to them. Secondly, personalizing it. We see godly men follow these examples. How can I be like that? And we can say, which of these five am I the weakest one in my life? And you can say, God, you know, I want to work on this one area. Say, well, I'm not real courageous. I'm timid. I'm weak. I don't step out of my comfort. So you can say, God, I'm going to really work on, on being courageous this week. So another way we take application is personalize it and say, how does this, how can I be more like this? This is the example. I need to follow that example. I need to set that example for others. So how am I going to change this week? And might even say, what, what is it that I can do this week to show more courage, to step out of my comfort zone, to follow God? Well, I know God wants me to do this, or I'm going to do this this week. We have a culture that idolizes celebrities and athletes and movie stars. But as Christians, we need to set an example for others. So have, after having gone through that passage, we've come away with a lot better understanding of what Paul's saying. So many times, we simply read the verses and we want to shut the Bible and go on and say, I didn't get anything out of that. But as we take time to read it, and read it again, and read it again, and reflect on it, to write things down, to look for comparing scripture with scripture and other passages, come away with application, then the truth hits home. Then the impact starts, and really the impact is just starting because we go on and throughout the day and the week, we don't just shut down this passage, we continue to think about it. So Monday while you're at work, you're, you're there working on a machine, you're thinking about, you know, godly men are caring, godly men are courageous. God, how can I be more like that? God, who do you want me to honor? Throughout the week, we continue to think about this. And that's how God takes the truth of this scripture and brings it into our life. That's just one passage. And we can use these same principles in any passage we come to. So I'd encourage you this week, don't just read. Don't just read a couple verses and shut the Bible. But take time to try to go deeper. To try to use some of these steps that we've talked about today. Let's pray again. Father, it is wonderful to know that when we take the time to read and study your word and turn the light on for us, that you help us to see the, the meaning and truth in your word. And I pray that you would help us now to think about this passage we've seen today and to reflect on it through this week. Help us to take the time to honor those who set a good example for us. Help us, Lord, to identify areas in our life where we need to work and do a better job of setting, setting an example. And help us, Lord, to have a greater commitment to studying your word. Not just reading it, but to actually go deeper in your word and apply your truth to our hearts and lives. 
Thank you for what we've seen today. And I pray that we bless now as we uh, share a kind of fellowship over the lunch meal together. In Jesus' name.